found in eastern and central Madagascar, growing in moist forests at 600 to 1,500 meters in areas with cool, fairly dry winters. Also found near Talatakeli, which is about 30 kilometers from Antananarivo, in the Ranomafana National Park, which stretches pretty much north-south on the eastern side of Madagascar. The closest I came to Madagascar was seeing it through my binoculars, was the north tip of the island as I passed it several times many, many moons ago on my way to Mauritius and Ile de Réunion. Passed it again, going to the Comores and the Seychelles. That is a very long intro, I know, for the Angraecum Didieri and for this care collab, which I'm doing today together with Ed's Orchids, Orchidea and Nicole Diana. And I have to say thank you so much for indulging me, for clicking on this video and watching. I appreciate your time very much. And Greycombs or Orangus can also be found in other parts of Africa, but what happens on Madagascar is totally different and distinct. The thing with Angraecum didieri is, we've just heard that it grows in cool, moist forests, but with a drier winter, quite high in elevation. And then there is the other side of the coin regarding Angraecum didieri that says it's a warm to hot grower. So which is it? For that reason here, in southern Spain, where I'm located with my didieri, I'm trying to keep it in a happy medium. So when I say cool and dry winters in my climate, it lives indoors under the blurple lights, directly under the blurple lights, which are about 45 centimeters from the tip of this orchid. You can see she's not very high. She's tiny and she can take that distance and she has a lot of high light because the area near Talatakeli is deciduous forests and they're also actually being eroded at this point. It's one of those working forests. Further south is another forest that remains intact as part of the national park. So to my understanding then, what I interpreted on this front is that the Didieri likes light during the winter, but when the temperatures drop, it shouldn't be kept that wet. That is my understanding. So my dry interpretation is not to water it too heavily, unless it starts to go into active growth, which is very slow on this orchid, but you can recognize it when a new leaf starts, then it's time to introduce some more water. My winters are not dry humidity wise. I can have an average of 70% humidity throughout the winters, some days higher, some days lower, but at least it gets 12 hours of light a day from the blurple lights because it is found very, very close to the equator where day lengths are steady 12 hours. So I try to compensate that in my winter as well, hopefully to keep it happy. In my summers, however, I get really, really hot. So for it being a warm to hot grower, according to some scribes, I can do that too. And I make sure though it is exposed to high light, but not direct sun. Contrary to what you're seeing here on filming, it lives in the dining room area, but on the lowest shelf, which to this day, which is now May, still gets a little bit of direct sun coming in through the glass based on the angle, but that is late afternoon, which means the sun isn't that hot. And I am always touching the leaves to make sure they don't heat up. And right now they're still quite cool. I don't want to burn the leaves on this orchid. Being such a slow grower, those leaves would stay on forever and I do not want to set this orchid back. I've had it now three years and it's slowly but surely doing something that a didieri would do and their acclimating process is over. We're done. Part of which that you see here, there's these very dry damaged tips. That's too much fertilizer from the jump when I got it, I thought I would help it in its acclimating process and give it a lot of fertilizer. Well, that was a mistake and I got that fertilizer burn on the tips of my leaves. So I piped down and in acclimating it, I used a lot of seaweed, a lot of RO water and every once in a while some calcium magnesium, but very low dose at 100 parts per million. So that's 100 parts per million calcium magnesium and then probably 40 to 50 parts per million of seaweed to acclimate it every week, so to speak. I got it in March 
three years ago. In that time frame, it was a question of, is it out of season or isn't it? Did it come from the nursery after being in the nursery for a long time, had it acclimated itself to the Northern Hemisphere? Or is it out of season because it was a new import coming from the Southern Hemisphere? So these are all factors I was trying to figure out while watching it do what it does. And I overdid it on the fertilizer. So very little fertilizer. But what I needed to do, because my hot summers were starting just when I got it, I needed to make sure that I could have plenty of humidity around it. And that's why it is in a small orchid top, only with lava rock in there. There is no ceramics, nothing. And for that reason, I don't need to move it a lot. Being an Angraecum, again, there is this thing going around. They don't like their roots disturbed. I don't know, I wouldn't know. I'm just erring on the side of caution by using a container where I don't have to mess with it for years and years and years. And I haven't had to mess with it. I even added then a little microfiber around the surface to not have the sphagnum moss going in and touching the base, risking a possible rot issue early days. And apart from the fact that the old roots failed, which was understandable in a way when they arrive, it's not the media I want them in. So lava rock was maybe a little bit on the too dry side when I got it, but needless to say, since then it's grown its new roots and they are well established in the pot. Here you can see a root growth dying back when it touched the microfiber. And to my understanding, that is because the microfiber still had too much fertilizer in it. And you can see the root has actually got sort of a brown look to it. That is too much fertilizer left in the microfiber. So I have reduced the spraying of the surface now to RO water only. And then the base has the fertilized water. Because seeing the length of these roots, I don't have a problem with roots down in the pot. I know we can't see them, but here is one. Hopefully you can see that one right here. Let me just make sure that one there, how long and down it is extending into the water. That is also something that tells me that in the pot, there is another one, probably the one that is right back here, that is even touching the water. I can tell by how the orchid is performing that she is getting plenty of hydration. So that is why fertilized water goes into my little plate down there and then the rest get, just gets misted with plain RO water, having learned my lesson here. My root tips were actively growing until recently and recently being maybe two weeks ago, but all throughout the winter they were actively growing and that is when I used to add a little bit of calcium and magnesium, but I was very, very careful with the misting so that I don't burn the root tips, they don't dry out quick enough. It was a fine balance at this point in time to make sure that my roots continue growing while also keeping the orchid hydrated. So a little bit of fertilizer in the winter, in my case, depending on what the orchid is doing, no fertilizer whatsoever. If at this point in time, if this were winter now and my roots had stopped growing, I wasn't growing a new leaf to, there's another one down in there, then it would just be plain RO water. The minute I see activity, I start to up the fertilizer and then bring it up to about 160. I don't want to go too mad with this orchid. These roots are very precious. And if the scribes say, do not disturb the roots, that to me doesn't just exclusively apply to when you're repotting, that applies in general. If the roots get damaged or broken, well, it is then of course, set back and it has to start again. So I'm very, very cautious here because finally I'm getting a spike. Now with all Angraecums, spikes are very slow in getting to develop and mature. There it is. And uh, if it is normal, then <clears throat> this spike has been in progress since December of 2020. That is a long time, five months. Uh, I don't know if it's even gonna make it, but I'm liking the fact that my little Didieri is now maturing to the point it's trying to push a spike. Nothing has dried up yet, but maybe it's one of those that's gonna go, okay, here I am, and maybe that spike will extend and bloom next year because when they do get big enough, then they can actually bloom five to six bloom on a single spike. 
Clearly mine isn't there yet. It's the first time I've seen a spike on this orchid. Who knows if I'm gonna have blooms in the summer. Usually they bloom in the winter in their environment. Is this spike, if it blooms during my summer months, then it's still not acclimated. And that is a big sign for me to know what is it doing, when is it doing it, and why is it not doing it according to the growth habit that it normally would have where it comes from. Spike developing in winter, got that, check. But it didn't bloom early spring. So is it gonna bloom in summer? Then it's still not acclimated because our summers is the winter in Madagascar. Very, very interesting to watch and observe in the coming months. If, it, if the spike just dries up and doesn't do anything and it just dries up, then I know it's acclimated, but the orchid as such isn't big enough yet to bloom. It was its first attempt. If the second attempt then also fails, then I know I'm not giving it enough fertilizer. And then I will have to revisit what am I doing during the year. And then when it pushes a spike, I'm being overly cautious on the fertilizer front with regards to the roots that it cannot develop and progress a spike. That remains to be seen. I can't answer that question this time around, but those are the thoughts I have in my head. As long as I know that there are roots reaching the bottom of the plate where the water is, then possibly if this one spike doesn't make it, the next one will because there is enough hydration, there is enough fertilizer, and there will be enough strength in the orchid to actually bloom. I think that the Angraecums are always considered big, massive, majestic monsters. But then you get these cute little ones like the Didieri. I don't have a picture clearly to show you, but they're gorgeous white flowers, very large in comparison to the size of the orchid itself. They're really big and they are nocturnally fragrant. So I'm looking forward to seeing what mine is going to do next and future updates will be really, really interesting in my opinion, and I hope that you will feel the same way when there are updates in the future. And before I go, I just want to say one more time, thank you so very much to Ed's Orchids, Orchidea and Nicole Diana for their videos, which are linked in the description below. I encourage you to go and have a look-see over there because I am sure that there are some blooms somewhere, and I won't give it away where, but, it is always exciting to see what each orchid does in the different setups and grow environments that we have. And someone's got a bloom or two going, so don't miss out and please check out those videos. Additionally, I want to add, if you're watching this video, if you're making videos, if you are actually posting on any social media platform and you have this orchid and Greg and Didieri, please know that you are welcome to let me know in the comments below that you have this orchid. You would like to be in on future videos with regards to the Care Collab initiative, and I'd be so happy to add you to the list. Thank you everyone so very much for watching. I hope this was somewhat interesting and can help you out if you're considering growing this orchid and if you're considering trying to figure out whether it is acclimated or not. I hope there were some helpful hints in there with regards to what your orchid is doing in your hemisphere and just making sure the leaves don't get hot. <laughs> she seems to be able to handle the sun quite well because they're still cool. Still, she's going back into the dining room where she has plenty of light right behind the glass and plenty of airflow as well. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everyone. I appreciate your time so very much. Take care, stay safe, bye.